What's going on guys? This is a collection of my popular RabbitMQ content here on YouTube. So I'm going to discuss RabbitMQ as a technology. I'm going to show you a little bit of my deep discussions of RabbitMQ as a technology, my pros and cons, I think what, what, what I think is good, what I think is bad about RabbitMQ. Then we're going to dive deep into some sort of, some sort of philosophical discussions of what RabbitMQ can evolve into, like a, can can you implement like quick technology in RabbitMQ or, or something like HTTP2 multiplexing and instead of having their own custom channel idea in their TCP, right? So some lot more discussion there. Then I'm gonna dive a little bit deep into how do you how RabbitMQ works today under the hood by doing a little bit of a wire sharking. Uh, uh, that protocol, the advanced message queue protocol, and see how it looks like, how chatty it is, how how consumer uh, and consumes, and how publisher actually publish pub sub queues, all that jazz. Can I talk about all that stuff? So if you're interested, check out this content, and can I see you on the next one? Check out the other content of of this channel. I discuss anything back in engineering. That's what I love to discuss. I'm gonna see you on the next one. Enjoy. What is going on guys? My name is Hussein and this video I want to discuss queues and when to use the queues, message queues to be specific. Like there are other type of queues, but I don't I'm not sure what are they. So I'm talking about RabbitMQ, ZeroMQ, Kafka. When do you want to use this in your architecture and do you really need it? Right? And that's the question here. You always have a question that, hey, do I really need to implement this in my system design or not? And I'm just trying to kind of assess that and help you with that if possible. So how about we jump into it? And if you're new here, guys, I discuss all sorts of backend engineering in this channel. So if you're interested, subscribe and like this video and share it with your friends. That's it. Let's just jump into it. All right. So what is a queue and when do we need to use it? And uh, guys, if you if you already uh, subscribe to my channel, you would see me repeat this over and over again any technology out there any backend technology out there it exists for a reason and it exists to solve a problem so i know that might sound cliche and it makes just perfect sense right just yeah of course it exists for a reason and that also means that there's no technology just exists for the fun of it or because it's cool right you need to use it if that problem exists for you you cannot just use gRPC because it's hip and cool, right? No, you should use it when you absolutely, the problems that gRPC addresses solves your problem, right? Addresses your problem. Same thing with a queue. So how about we talk about the actual problems with the queue solved? Back to the request response architecture. When I make a request to a backend and regardless of the communication protocol that I use, whether it's TCP, stateful TCP, raw, or whether I'm using gRPC, again, stateful, or whether I'm, whether I'm using a stateless REST architecture, that request requires some resources at the backend to be served, right? To be consumed and executed that request. What does that mean? It means that request might be less to get all the employees, right? Or an update to do a booking system, right? It's like, hey, I'm going to book this seat. That's the that's that's same thing, right? And this requires a finite amount of time of your server to actually process this. And we talked about the ways you can serve your request. And one way to solve this problem is asynchronous execution with a single thread, like your server has one thread, and that thread just keeps working the problems that it has, right? So serving request, this is now it's listening to TCP connection, this is now doing that, that's how Node.js does it, right? Other, other web servers 
uh, does it differently. Multi-threading, multi-processing, right? Regardless, right? So Apache does it multi-threading, Node.js does a single thread, but it's asynchronous. And we talked about that. I'm going to reference the video here. I think it's here. <laughs> Go check it out. But sometimes a single thread in a Node.js or multi processing or multi-threading in a web server could not cut it because you will quickly overwhelm that single server to execute all these requests right and it, it, it really depends if that request is taking a long time to process and if it does that if that request is taking a huge amount of time an unpredictable amount of time to process then there are flood of other requests that is coming. I'm, I'm not talking about queues yet, guys, right? Just normal request response. There are a flood of requests coming and they are waiting. And when I say waiting, they, the client is actually just blocked because that access to the TCP connection didn't even get a response back. Okay. And that could be harmful for the user experience, right? The user will feel it. So, Ooh, what is going on? I click and nothing happened. And users hate that. When they click and nothing happens, you show me something that happens or tell me that something is happening, but don't tell me that I'm doing something and I did something and I don't see any results. They hate that. You're a user. You've probably <laughs> seen that. So how do we trick that? A, requ a normal request response architecture doesn't cut it in this case. If your response time is unpredictable, right? Because you have a lot of requests coming and you might say, hey, Hussein, I'm going to scale horizontally. And that's absolutely fine. You can do that. You can put a reverse proxy, have it configured to be a load balancer and swizzle the request to all the other services and if you have, if you start waiting, if you've started seeing requests taking a long time to process, right, then you start spinning up more services or containers if you're in a microservices architecture and then start serving that. And people do this to this day without a queue, without the idea of a queue, right? And as I said, this doesn't really scale well if your processing at the back end is, is very hungry, processing hungry or CPU hungry or even RAM hungry right? because you're going to spend a lot of time just uh, having this process take time. So if you're predicting that responses will always take a long time, probably spinning up multiple services will not help you. Right, because the request will be the same whether it's going, uh, it's sending to another server which are fr which is free or a service that is server doing other things as well. Yeah, you're gonna st see some mindless, mindless cool, ah, minus cool. <laughs> is that the right word? Minus cool difference, but still, it's gonna take a long time. So here's where a queue is useful. If you're really think that request will always exponentially go large yeah maybe if your database is uh, doesn't have any rows but as you grow large that request will go slower and slower and slower what is that exponentially not necessarily exponentially just uh, polynomially with your number of rows so here's where q really beneficial so what you would do in this case is here's what i'm gonna do i'm gonna employ a queue in my system a message queue and that means if i am receiving a request the server i will do a very quick operation that is constant that is a big o of one it's a very fast operation and i'm gonna respond to the user with a with some sort of an identifier right and here's that's that's how a queue works. So if I send me a request, I'm gonna put it in a queue. That's a big off one because writing is always fast, especially if you're in a LSM tree kind of a database, right? And most databases now, especially write only, just write to the end. LSM, right? Uh, log structure mercy. You write it and then you respond back to the user. Hey, I committed to you, user, that I have received your request. And it's now processing. 
or it's now it's in the queue. It, I can't promise anything else, but hey, I received it. Better than having a request that is not served, right? That is not just waiting. So check user experience better, right? Okay, I'm willing to wait as a user. Yeah, at least I see they received it. And now really up to you as, as an architect. You can have the client come back and ask and poll, P-O-L-L, this task ID that we're given. He say, hey, how's, how's this job down doing? How's this job doing? How's this, this job doing? And once that response actually complete, the response will come back. Say, hey, that job is done. Okay, you can now do whatever you want to do. That's one way of solving the problem. RabbitMQ doesn't do it this way. Uh, RabbitMQ does it the push way, right? Where it's just like a stateful connection. I forgot what the, the protocol that RabbitMQ uses, but it's a, it's, a, it's a very elegant way of using channels. It's awesome. I love it. And I'm going to make another video about this compared to HTTP2. The idea of RabbitMQ using channels, it's very similar to streams. And I don't know who came up with this idea before. Regardless, get back to the point. If I respond back, if that job is dequeued, right, or executed, that could push results back to the client immediately as they are received, right? So this way, you eliminated the latency of waiting. Client is still technically didn't receive the result, right? Because you don't receive the result, but I can unblock the user experience. I can show some sort of a progress bar. I can, I can give a better user experience. And I elevated the flood of request on my server. Now I'm going to have a nice queue. Yes, it's a centralized system still, but it's a nice queue and people, people, <laughs> services can listen to this queue and start pulling jobs, pulling tasks and execute and write it back to the queue, right? Very, very similar to a pub sub system, except the only difference between a queue and a pub sub a queue is whenever you remove an item from the queue, it is gone, right? That service owns it. It is dequeued. Versus the pub subsystem, you have a topic, or very similarly, right? The brokers have these topics, and the service can as infinitely consume the same item. Many services can consume the same item, right? But now each service have some sort of a position that remembers, oh, I consumed this. Yes, I consumed this. I consumed this. And the service optionally can have a way to go back and forth in the queue and the, in the pop subsystem. So that's a very quick, very quick way of knowing how do you actually, when do you want to use a queue versus uh, just a normal request uh, process request system and load balancing and all that stuff, right? So very quick, if your request is indeterministic, you don't know how long it's going to take, a queue is probably a good idea for you. If your process is by nature long running, a queue is good for you, right? Just queue it and let other process pick up uh, the work and write it back to the queue. Or if it's a uh, resource hungry, if your by default, your process back in processing is a resource hungry, it's a bad idea to have the web server itself do the work for you. The web server should do one job and one job only. It shouldn't process your stinking request. It should just respond back to web traffic. It serves web. It is a web server. It serves web traffic and that's it. Don't let it process your prime numbers or do a very complex operations in the web server stuff. Try to separate concerns as much as possible. All right, guys, that's a quick video just to let you know the difference between when to use a queue, when to not use a queue. Hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, subscribe if you like this content. Like this video if you like it. I'm going to see you in the next one. You say, guys, stay awesome. One of you guys asked me a question, which is better, REST 
or message queue? I struggled to answer for a while, but after thinking about it, I discovered that both REST and message queue does boil down to the basic elements, which are basically REST being HTTP, which is request response, and message queue being publish subscribe. In this video, I want to discuss both the request response and the publish subscribe architecture and talk about the pros and cons of each. So if you're interested, stay tuned. You're new here. Welcome. My name is Hussein and on this channel we discuss all sorts of software engineering by example. So if you want to become a better software engineer, consider subscribing. Hit that bell icon so you get notified every time I upload a new video. With that said, let's just jump into this video. Pub sub. Let's do this. All right, here's the agenda. What we're going to do is like we're going to talk about request response a little bit and then we're going to talk about where the request response actually breaks right because nothing is perfect in life apparently right and as i start talking about that you guys are going to see time codes where you can jump to the interesting part of the video request response pros and cons that's another thing we're going to discuss right what's the good what's the bad about this technology publish subscribe architecture we're going to talk about that how it actually works what is it right with example and then finally we're going to talk about pub sub pros and cons if you're interested stay tuned so, let's start with the request response model it's a very elegant and simple design that had been designed in the 90s and the whole internet is running on this thing it's very very simple design that's why it's popular so you're a client you're a web server and the client makes a request. Let's say this is a GET request over HTTP. The client waits. The client is blocked. Now you can argue with that whether it's blocked and cannot do anything else, right? Which is no longer true because we have asynchronous requests, right? You can make a request and you can do other stuff in the background. That's okay, right? Because it's, it's just you make a request, you wait, and you don't actively wait you don't spend any processing power waiting right you just make a request and forget about it right and then once the request comes back you get back a content and then you do something with this content right so that's the request response model it's always the client initiating the request there is no other way coming from the web server okay and i'm gonna reference a video here for the asynchronous uh, versus asynchronous so uh, there are a list of playlists that you can go and watch that if you're interested to know more all right and where does this break is this perfect obviously nothing is perfect let's assume you have this system where you want to upload a video let's say this is youtube and obviously when you upload a video to youtube you don't just upload a video there are a lot of stuff happening in the background so you want to upload the raw video you want to youtube want to compress the video because usually it's that raw mp4 file is very huge right you want to compress it and after compress is done you want to pick that up by the format service you want to format it and what does that mean you want to produce different video ties for the appropriate devices so you want to provide a video for mobile phones so that's a maybe 480 or 720 or 1080 or 4k you want to produce different kind of content right based on the viewing platform and provide that and you want to also once this is done you want to notify subscribers so how do you do that with just request response well it's still simple but it really breaks down if you think about it so client makes a request uploads that beautiful raw mp4 va video right and it waits right it can do other stuff in the background but still waiting right and then upload service processing that stuff and then once it's done it now it is waiting and it's making a request to the compress service to compress the uploaded video all right okay that's make a request now the compressed video is processing and when it is, it is done it is waiting and make a request to the format service and waits right so a lot of people are waiting there's a chain of people waiting for this thing to get done format service is processing producing all these 418 720 and 1080 and 4k and 8k there's no 8k right it's a fad <laughs> i don't know if that's true <laughs> okay format service is just processing that stuff and then once it's done 
it will make the request to the notification service like, okay, I'm done. Let's make a request to the notification service, which will notify all the subscribers, obviously, that, hey, we're done. This video is uploaded. Go and and that and then the format service is waiting for the notification service and you guys can't argue with this like oh god no really we can notify people once it's uploaded right no really you, you want to notify people when it's ready to be consumed when it's here it's not ready to be consumed right so and, and that even get more complicated as we talk about it all right notification service said okay i'm done the first response format service said i'm done compressor service, i'm done so if people start unblocking services start unblocking requests as they come in and finally the client would say who done upload it all right obviously guys put anything that breaks in the middle the whole thing is broken i'm sorry about that <laughs> okay so the whole thing is essentially broken right once you put any obstacle and network error the whole chain is broken and, and you don't know if this thing is finished or not. That's the problem we're facing with request response. If you're chaining multiple services, especially in a microservices architecture, that breaks down. Let's say we uh, want to add another copyrighted service. And we want this uh, to the copyright service, like to check the content for content IDs and check if uh, there is like a copyright infringement, right? So you want to consume the compressed service need to send the compressed file to both format and copyrighted oh my god right this topology gets really complicated real quick son right all right what's good what's bad about this pros it's very elegant and simple yes if you have only two pieces of software talking to each other that's beautiful and i still love that but once you get into complicated scenarios not really Right, it's elegant and simple. I love that. It's stateless, especially when you use HTTP. That's not really true for like uh, request response, like a database. Like database, you make a SQL. That's still request response. You make a update table where blah equal blah. That's a request. And then when you get a better result, like hey, seventy year old updated. That's a response, right? That's still a request response, but that's that's nowhere stateless. <laughs> It's as stateful as it gets, right? HTTP and other is stateless. But yes, you can argue with that. But but it is, if it's stateless, it's good because it's scalable, right? You can scale it horizontally, and that's a very overloaded word. I hate putting it there, but I have to put something in the pro section. Scalable here means that it is scalable at that receiver end where you can duplicate the receiver if it's the same content, right? It's the same, it has the same functionality. You can duplicate it easily and you can scale it easily, right? Because it just makes the same request. Right? You can put it behind a load balancer and beautiful idea, right? Load balancer can just route requests to any service and it just scales very nicely, right? But it's not really scalable in other terms, right? So scalable here is a very overloaded word. And I'm really mean about horizontal scalability of the same duplicated service. Oh my god, that's getting complicated. Okay, what was that? Cons, what's bad about this? Obviously, as we said, it's very bad for multiple receivers. The moment you start seeing a lot of receivers, a lot of consumers, you start really wearing yourself down and, and, and yeah, things can go really long. The moment you insert anything in the middle, right, you, your architecture falls apart, okay? That's why you have to start hacking things around how do you hack things around right you basically introduce high coupling so people a lot of services start talking to each other which produces a lot of high coupled services so services start knowing each other and that's bad we want software to have social anxiety we do not want software to talk to each other that's bad in software high coupling is bad we want software to be as oblivious as possible about the whole system high coupling yeah we talked about that client and server have to be running you want to say hussein that's just 
weird of course i'm gonna send a request if the server is down yeah of course the client have and server has to be running to communicate are you telling me there's something better than that where the client can go offline and or the server can go offline and still they can communicate oh we're gonna see about that all right yeah so that's kind of a disadvantage upsub has this advantage still have my concerns about that but we're gonna talk about that all right so chaining circuit breaking retries all that stuff that we introduce just to solve the problem of of how can we guarantee that these topology of systems connect together right the highly coupled system can correctly talk to each other right we need to time out correctly we need to retry if that didn't work and that just put a lot of pressure on the service and complicate things even worse right and that is a problem by itself. It's not an easy problem to solve. Yes, service meshes take care of that stuff. A clients like Finagle on Twitter, that open source to Finagle can take care of that stuff for you, right? If you make a request. But to me, still sounds like we have a very complex system. So I don't know about that. Right, yeah. All right, pop sub to the rescue. It's the best thing ever. Not really. All right, so let's talk about PubSub, the published subscribe model. All right, we'll take the same example, the YouTube uploading service, and we're gonna upload a video, and we're gonna compress the video, we're gonna format the video, we're gonna notify people. How about that? So there is, as you can see here, there, you can see still the services here, the client here, the notification services, all that jazz, but there's some box here. This box is the middle, middle layer that, everybody's communicate to and this is called multiple names people call it broker people call it message queue people call it streaming processing a lot of names but it's a middleware layer where you can push and publish content to it and it will take care of delivering that content to someone else okay based on the subscription model so these guys subscribe these guys publish everybody can publish and subscribe at the same time and you publish and you subscribe and publish to what is called a queue or sometimes called topic like kafka call it topic uh, uh rabbit mq call it queue channels is called i think redis call it channels right so by the way redis and kafka and rabbit mq zero mq all of that stuff are just this message queue that supports pops up right all right, let's go through an example and see if this thing is good or not, all right? So here's the thing, well, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna, I'm making a client, I'm gonna upload the service. Still, this is, to, a, to an extent, this is still a request response, right? You can still mesh and mash. What does that mean, mesh and mash? I don't think it's a word. But yeah, you can do a hybrid between request response and pub sub, so that's okay, right? So you make a request, and upload service still processing, waiting for all your stuff. So the client is blocked now, right? And again, guys, when I say blocked, doesn't mean he cannot do anything or she cannot do anything. Why am I referring to computers as gender? Okay, I don't know. All right, so you make a request, and it waits right it still can do other stuff in the background obviously but it is asynchronous not nevertheless so upload service processing once it's done the upload service will say you know what just give me a second give me a second give me a second i'm gonna publish this really quick to this topic and once i get the result and which is usually this quick because these guys are in the same network interface i'm assuming this is another network interface and this is another network interface, so they communicate with this. I am hoping this is in the same, hopefully, air, LAN area. And they will communicate with their, like, in a 10 gigabit uh, Ethernet network or whatever. And that will become fast, right? So we make a request, and then we'll get a response real quick, upload that 5 gig video. Once it's done, that's it. Your job is done as upload service. So you, you can notify the client that it's done. Let's, let's repeat that, right? All right. So upload, once it's done, publish it to a topic or a channel and get back a result and then shoot, upload it, done. That's it, the client now done's job. You can disconnect the client, you can just move on with your life, the video is in the system and leave, right?
Obviously, that means this guy has to be up all the time. That's what she said. But what we have here is essentially a topic. And that topic or the channel has the content. It's sometimes called a queue, a topic, a channel. And that has the raw MP4 videos. Now, how do people consume it? These guys would have been subscribed already to a topic that already exists. I just hide it. I did some animation. But compressed service, in this case, is subscribing to this topic. Now, we're going to talk in details like how this is actually done. Is it, what does it mean to subscribe, right? It's very weird, abstract word, right? Is it, are you pushing the result of compressed service the moment you have a raw mp4 video or is the compressed service actually pulling information or is is it like pinging what's happening here right so you gotta tell me more right so the compressed service ha there are multiple implementations we're gonna talk about them but posh and long pulling and, and, and pulling just pulling is just useless i don't know why would you do that it's just same as request response but all right so the compressed service will receive now the raw mp4 value let's imagine that it just got it like immediately pushed to it right that has this limitation obviously but we're going to talk about that the compressed service received this raw mp4 video start processing it and guess what it will publish its own compressed video to another topic that says hey compressed video here is it all right it's a topic so it doesn't really know who's gonna consume it. The upload service didn't know that the compressed service is gonna consume it. And that's the decoupling that we talked about. Bleh. Just decouple that everybody from each other. The, the format service is now subscribed to the compressed video topic and it will get it immediately. Let's, this is a little bit okay. Yeah, you get it, whether it's push or long polling, whatever. You get it. Format service, it's just like publishing content. Look at that. 480p, 1080p. This is Gary V, man. Format service is Gary V. Just, just producing content like there's no tomorrow. Format service publishes all our stuff so that it's done. Now, the notification service, let's say your notification, you want to notify people when the 4K video is ready. I know this is a little bit harsh. You want to notify people the moment the 480p video is, is ready. So it's up to you. You want, for example, to notify people when the highest quality video is available, that's gonna take a long time to notify people, obviously, but nevertheless, right, you got it. All right, and then you can easily fit the copyright service, right? We talked about and just slam it there and subscribe to the, I don't know, the compressed video, and that will just immediately find any content ID and then there, right? So it's a beautiful design. Is it perfect though? I don't know, let's find out. Pros, what's good about this? Let's find out. Obviously, it scales with multiple subscribers, right? Multiple receivers, multiple consumers. It's great for multiple receivers because they can. you can add as many receivers and unique receivers here. We're talking about unique, different, distinct receivers, right? They are different from each other. They have different needs. They have different wants and they want to be scaled. You can scale them beautifully, right? Unlike the request response where they have to be aware of each other and that's bad. All right, so this thing is great for microservices, all right? It's amazing, right? Because the moment you have multiple services, in order to avoid the spaghetti uh, mesh topology of everything is connected to everything, you can, you can just have this one place and everything's connected to this place. Now you have a center, almost like a center single point of failure, but that can be dealt with differently, right? We're gonna talk about the pros and cons. Loose coupling, you just decoupled things. Now the services are not aware of each other. That's good. We like that stuff, right? The moment that they, the, the less things are coupled to each other, the more they can essentially scale and be added and be the system can be modified easily right because you cannot you can smartly change one thing without breaking the entire system because low coupling are bad because the moment you have a service that depends on 700 services any small change can break any of these 700 clients, right? So if you have, if you're sure that your only client is the PubSub system, 
you're golden right works while clients not running well yeah but right so if if we go back to the example there and we saw like the notification service if if any of these services are offline we don't really care the moment they come back online they will subscribe and they will say hey we have a new message we have a new topic let's consume it right so that's okay because the message is already stored in the queue in the topic in the channel right so that's how but that also means there's problems let's talk about the problems cons all right there are obviously message delivery issues all right so the message delivery issues about when when we have a subscriber and we have a miss message queue or we have a publisher and we have this message queue and you're publishing something how do you know that the the queue the message has been published that's the first thing okay well you can say that well hussein message queue will 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 send me a notification i can only mean hey you're done good stuff we're good all right and that you don't care about anything else for the publisher that's good okay if you don't receive the acknowledgement you might try again and that that's a problem okay like how do you know that if if i actually if i published again how do i know i didn't publish the same content twice right we have ways of solving this with i don't potency but still get it still complicate complication going on there right and who's taking care of this complication should it be me as a publisher or should it be the message queue i don't know right the other problem is the subscriber now the subscriber that's that's the, that's the challenging part how do you know as a subscriber that the sub this subscriber this consumer this compressed service actually got the content first how do you know that it actually processed the content because it has to tell the service hey by the way i read the i read this message just the fact that this acknowledgement that hey i read the message people are taking phds in this because it's so hard right it is so hard to know that a message has been consumed or not how do you know right you can send an acknowledgement but about what if the acknowledgement didn't, you didn't get it all right so we talked about the message delivery issues obviously and now let's talk about the complexity it is a very complex system because of the message delivery issue, we try to find ways around it, okay? And to find ways around it, we add complexity. Okay, so it's first, first simple here. Let's talk about the push and the pull and the long pulling model. How do you deliver a message from the topic, right? How do the broker deliver a message from the topic to the subscriber or to the consumer, okay? How does that happen, right? You can you can imagine like RabbitMQ or Redis, and uh, we made a RabbitMQ video here. I'm gonna reference it here so you can you guys check it out. But it's very interesting. And what you want to do essentially is first thing is you wanted to establish a two-way communication like a TCP channel, right? And then RabbitMQ has its own protocol. I think it's called. It's not really its own, but it's a standard, it's an advanced message queue protocol. And they're using that, and it's a two-way communication, it's a two-way binary protocol, and they talk about it. Redis have its own REST protocol. I don't know what REST stands for, what, but I forgot. So they, again, it's a bi-way, two-way communication, where it's like, you communicate on both directions, and then now you can start sending push messages as a result, because it's a two-way communication, right? And push messages push notification or push model is very complicated you might it might sound nice hey the moment i get a topic immediately pushed to the subscriber that sounds beautiful because it's almost real time but what happens if the client is offline what happens if the consumer is offline you okay well, you can say they let's hold the message until they are online and then when they are online push it okay that seems reasonable all right, but, but how do you know that they are offline and they're not that, that, that status, right? It's, you're almost keeping track of the subscriber in your message queue. And that might be okay if you think about it, but that adds additional complexity. Another complexity is the back pressure where you the publisher is so fast in producing 
content, let's say a publisher is Gary Vee, is just like grinding content daily, right? Not daily, every second, just publishing stuff all the time. And then the poor consumer can barely consume these messages. They are, right? There's just the flood of push messages, the little tiny device, for example, that consumes that stuff, cannot handle that load. It just cannot. It cannot handle something that's shoved down their throat. Obviously, it's going to wait, right? And these, what do you do with these awaited messages? Do you just put them back? And do you, do you time out? Do you put them, do you, and, and do you now keep track? Oh, this client is, is slow, so I'm going to slow down. This client is fast. I'm going to speed up. That's a very complex problem to solve by itself, right? That's with self, that's a problem, right? And then another problem is, okay, so we might say that's the RabbitMQ on Redis uses that, okay, that has its own limitation. So the other approach is to do like the polling method, right? Where do I have a message? Do I have a message? Do I have a message? As a client, you say, do I have a message? 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 Well, if you don't, then you just kind of saturated the network with empty requests, which kind of busyness, right? Right, that's a problem. Okay, that's a, uh, that's, that's a lot of processing wasted cycles for requesting empty responses, right? There's nothing for you, so why you keep requesting? So the, so the solution, the part solution is to use long polling method, which Kafka uses, right? Which is like, hey, you make a request and you block yourself. Right, we're gonna block you essentially, as if you made a request and we're taking a long time processing it. But there is there is really nothing to process. Nobody's busy, and because it's a beautiful of asynchronousy in this age, it's fine. You can wait, but you can do other stuff in the meantime. You, the only thing that I spent is memory here. That's the only thing I spent. Maybe a little bit of an event main loop, just checking if there's something came back or not. But that you're doing that anyway, right? So it's it's not much. So the long polling, that's what Kafka uses, right? And then that has its also limitation, obviously, because like you might not get best real time, but you solve the problem of uh, essentially the the back pressure of shoving a lot of messages for clients who cannot be ready to consume messages, right? Obviously, it's a very complex system. And network saturation, in case of push, you're pushing a lot of messages, you're shoving the network with a huge amount of notifications and content, right? That That's a lot of content going to the network, sometimes unnecessarily because the client doesn't really necessarily can process these messages which which might lead to failure which may which may lead to you retrying the broker can have to retry these requests which is also bad right and then network saturation on the other hand is like the other way under utilization which i didn't write here it's just like hey i make a request but i don't see anything i make a request i don't see anything so Summary, what did we discuss in this video? We talked about where the request response model breaks, right? It's a beautiful design, but it has its limitation, right? We talked about the pros and cons of this request response. We talked about the publish subscribe pattern or architecture. I don't know what you call it, right? Publish subscribe architecture or pattern, whatever rocks your boat. And we talked about the pros and cons of that thing, okay? The example of this is Kafka, RabbitMQ, and Redis. We made a video about Redis. We made a video about RabbitMQ. I am making a video about Kafka. Still in the process. I'm going to let you guys know. If you want to know, if you want to really see the video about the Kafka, write down in the comment section right now, write Kafka. So we can actually, I see if there's a lot of interest in that. You guys give me a lot of great suggestion. I love those videos, suggestion. I'm making them, I'm enjoying making all this content. It's a long form content, I know it's a lecture. This is not a three minute video that you will watch, right? And then you move on. It's a few, This is videos that you watch if you're serious to learn, obviously. And no lecture, no 10 minute video can give you anything.
value really or five minutes video you're gonna watch and learn about a lot of stuff okay that's the kind of content we make in this channel so if you're interested consider subscribing like this video if you like it and share it with your friend i'm gonna see you in the next one you guys stay awesome RabbitMQ is an open source distributed message queue written in Erlang and supports many communication protocols. It was trying to solve a problem with what we call the spaghetti mesh architecture. You know, guys, remember where every client is trying to talk to another client in the system. Remember, guys, the days of the enterprise message bus and all this God awful days, you know? So RabbitQ was introduced to solve this problem, right? By introducing this intermediate layer. In this video, we will explain the main basic components of RabbitMQ, right? And you gotta start seeing jump codes or time codes, guys, where you want to jump to the interesting topics and, and you don't have to watch the whole videos, just whatever you're interested in, you can jump to that, right? So we're gonna talk about the RabbitMQ components such as, such as the advanced message queue protocol, AMQP, what is a channel, what is a queue, what is a publisher, what is a consumer, what is an exchange, what is all that stuff, right? And then we're gonna talk about the meat and potatoes of all this stuff, where we will actually spin up our own RabbitMQ server with Docker, okay? Then, obviously that's not enough, we're gonna write some code, we're gonna write our own publisher that uses Node.js, okay, that publishes to the RabbitMQ server, okay, and then we're gonna write our own consumer piece with JavaScript, Node.js, that will consume that queue, that will consume these messages, okay? Finally, Guys, I want to talk about my thoughts, my personal thoughts about this technology. Finally, obviously, we're going to summarize the whole thing. All right, guys, if you're new here, welcome. My name is Hussein, and in this channel, we discuss all sorts of software engineering by example. So if you want to become a better software engineer, consider subscribing, hit that bell icon so you get notified every time I upload a new video. With that said, let's just jump into this video, guys. All right, so RabbitMQ. So here's the architecture of RabbitMQ. RabbitMQ uses this middle layer and solves, as we talked about, solves a problem where clients want to talk another to other clients in the same system or external systems. And instead of having each client having knowledge of other clients, we kind of grouped everything into this layer. Okay, we call this RabbitMQ server. RabbitMQ server listens to 5672 port by default because it's a server, it has to listen, right? Because it's using TCP. Okay, so that's the first abstraction, the RabbitMQ server. There's a lot of pieces inside of that. I'm not gonna go through that yet, but I wanna explain that first piece, which is the server. This could be multiple servers, could be distributed, replicated, and all that jazz, right? But we have this first piece, the RabbitMQ server. The, the second piece, or third piece, is the publisher, where, hey, I am a client, and I want to publish a message for certain consumers that are interested in this message. Uh, and we're going to talk about an actual example, guys, where we write the code. But essentially what the publisher does is it establishes a stateful TCP connection between itself and the RabbitMQ server. And this is very critical to understand. It's a two-way communication. Okay, So the underlining transport protocol is TCP. Okay, it's not HTTP, okay? it's using TCP, raw TCP. And there's a nice protocol on top of it. Okay? There are multiple protocols, but we're, we're interested in is, is the advanced message queue protocol. There's like certain headers, certain messages, right? Think of it just like an application layer HTTP where it uses TCP, right? It has its own headers and body and get and methods and post, right? The advanced message queue protocol has its own format as well. It has its own protocol. Okay, so it uses that, okay? And then it uses that and, and publisher can send messages to the server. The server can send messages to the publisher. So it's a two-way communication, very critical to understand, okay? So there is a connection. So that's the second abstraction, a connection. Third abstraction. So a publisher, a connection to the server. There's a consumer who want to consume messages. So they will connect, again, using a stateful, two-way bi-directional TCP connection 
to the server using the advanced message protocol. There are other protocols, but I'm not going to talk about this in this video, right? So let's focus on just one protocol here. So the AMQP protocols, oh, man, that's hard to pronounce, all right? So the consumer establishes a two-way communication with the server and says, hey, what's up, server? Sup? Give me some messages, right? So, and the server will start pushing messages. Emphasis on the pushing, guys. Very strong word here, the pushing. The server pushes messages to the consumer, okay? Very interesting, okay? So the server pushes messages to the consumer when they are ready, okay? When they have them messages. And there is the publisher sent messages to the server. Another abstraction for RabbitMQ is what they call the channel, okay? And the channel is a logical connection in your connection. It's just like a mini connection, think of it, right? And the reason they did that, they want to separate the consumer connection from multiple consumers inside that consumer. An example would be you would create this consumer have three channels using the same TCP connection. And the reason they're using that is just instead of if you're trying to like instead of having three consumers having three TCP connections, let's have one consumers or three channels with one TCP connection. This is called multiplexing, where you bring a lot of stuff into one pipe. And that's a good thing. I like this about it. I like it a lot, right? You can use the same TCP connection, but you can send certain bits with the channel ID. Say, hey, this is, by the way, this belongs to this channel, this belongs to this channel, this belongs to this channel. So they can segregate and do certain things based on that. So that's an, a nice abstraction, right? A channel, okay? Same thing with the publisher. So you can send through a certain channel, okay? If you don't have channels, then the publisher, let's say you write a publisher that does more than one thing, okay? you have, you will be forced to use multiple publishers instead of uh, kind of putting all your code into one publisher or one consumer, right? Another abstraction is, is, is what the Q stands for, is the Q, right? All of this stuff goes into the Qs, okay? So the Q is like you send an information, it goes to the Q, and then other uh, the consumer will basically pull information from the queue, right? And that, that's that's where the queue is, right? But however, that's very important. The publisher and consumer are not aware of queues, okay? Technically, they are aware of what they call exchanges, and that's the seventh <laughs> abstraction on this rabbit in queue, okay? There is an exchange where you, the whole thing is, is an exchange. There is a default exchange, and you send all that stuff to an exchange, and that will take care of propagating into a queue, right? You don't have to know about this. We're not going to talk about exchanges as well. We're going to use the default exchange, which takes care about a lot of stuff, right? An exchange can be used to use different algorithms to, to kind of fan out and do, do a round robin into uh, different queues. But that's, that's out of the scope of the video as well. Because we have exchanges, we have queues. But let's, let's just think about the concept of a queue where you put a message, publisher, publisher message, Goes to the queue, consumer consumes a message from a queue. And the exchange is that default exchange thing, right? You can have multiple exchanges as well. All right, guys, how about we spin up our own rabbit in queue and we play with this thing, okay? All right, guys, so to spin up our own rabbit in queue server, I'm not going to tell you to download and install that thing, right? You don't have to pull it to your machine with, with, your, with these installers. So what you have to do is just install Docker, make sure you can say Docker and you get some sort of a feedback here and you make sure to, you can do Docker run hello dash word. If this gives you back hello Docker, that means you have Docker installed. Once you have Docker installed, we're gonna spin up our own RabbitMQ message container if you will, and that message container, message server, that container will have a RabbitMQ server from which we will start writing code, okay? And we're gonna talk about what we're gonna write, but let's first spin up that, that thing. How do we do it? Very simple. Okay, so first thing we wanna do is write docker run, okay? And by always, make it a habit to give your container a name. Let's give it a name, rabbit MQ. 
okay? And then once we give it a name, we will expose the port of that container to my machine so I can communicate with it, right? So that's essentially what's the default port of RabbitMQ. You have to memorize that, 5672, right? And what is, that's what I want to expose to my machine. This could be anything, right? The second part of 5672 is what is inside your container, right? So that has to stay, that has to stay, 5672, this could be anything you want, okay? And then let's, let's just use this uh, default thing, okay? And then finally we do rabbit MQ, and that's the image from which we're gonna pull the rabbit MQ Docker image, from which we're gonna spin a container. Let's go ahead and spin that, and just like that, we're gonna start downloading all that stuff, right? And then, uh, yeah, just like that, this terminal is now occupied, right? So this, you can start seeing the messages that goes into this Docker uh, container, which is the RabbitMQ, okay? Now we have a container that is running and have RabbitMQ. What are we gonna build with this technology? Here's what we're gonna build. We will build an asynchronous job execution, okay, engine. And how this works is essentially, we'll have a publisher that will publish job and say, hey, consumers, I want you to execute this job, and I want you to execute this job. And then there was, will be a consumer, which is essentially a process that will take that job and start executing it, right? This could be like, uh, think of it like uh, you, you're publishing tasks, and these tasks are executed by actual processes, right? And this could be heavy processes, like, I don't know, calculating the prime number of certain number, or finding, or going to the database and doing a batch job, or doing a... Um, a Hadoop job, right? A map reduce, right? So all kind of job. We're gonna publish it to the queue. We're gonna publish it to the Rabbit MQ message, and then the consumers will start pulling the. Don't stop pulling. They will get that message, that get that job, and start executing it. All right. So now that we know what we're gonna build, let's go ahead and build it. All right, guys. So. What you're gonna need here is you're gonna install Visual Studio Code or any favorite editor you have. I'm gonna use Node.js as my execution engine here to build my publisher and consumer. And here's what we're gonna build, right? So let's go ahead and build a publisher, okay? My publisher and consumer will live in the same project, that's okay, because we're gonna do uh, have a different uh, kind of input to things, right? So let's go ahead and build the project. So you go go ahead and go file, open, and then we'll go to JavaScript here, playground, and let's create a project called Rabbit MQ. Just a blank folder. We're gonna go ahead and create a publisher.js file. And here's the thing, guys. Let's go ahead and initialize npm. So we create a project npm init dash y. Right, that means shut up. I know what I'm doing. Just give me a package to JSON. We're gonna use that later. And now, here's what I want to do. I'm going to create a const. And then, what we want to do is we talked about this a little bit when we explained that, right? And that we talked about RabbitMQ uses the advanced message queue protocol, the AMQP, and this protocol has a lot of clients and Node.js has that client. So I'm gonna create an advanced message queue protocol instance, and then we're gonna acquire that library, which is called Ad a advanced message queue protocol library. Okay, that's what it's called. And that's a promise-based library, which is amazing because we love promise aside stuff. It's using, I think, a blue bird to, to prom promiseify. Promise is a god, I can't pronounce anything. Promiseify this things, okay? So I have that. So the, what is the first abstraction we do, right? We're gonna create a connection to my server. Do you remember where my server is running? Do you remember the port, guys? I hope you do, yeah, because that we're gonna use that. But first of all, since we're gonna use a, a promise-based thing, let's create a function. Obviously, it's gonna be an async function. We're gonna call it connect, right? We're gonna call it publish, anything you want. And uh, we're gonna do a try catch, just to catch any 
bad things, right? And then console.law.error, yeah, so just, just build a skeleton here. And here's the first thing we're gonna do. We're gonna do a connection. Create a connection, how do we do that? amqp.connect, that's not hard. What do you expect? You want a string from me. What's the URL? Here's the URL, guys. Since we're using the advanced message queue protocol, that's the protocol we're using. And since my RabbitMQ is used running on my Mac, it's gonna be localhost or the machine. So what is the port, guys? It's 5672, I can't memorize that thing, okay? And here's the thing, guys. Since this is a returns a promise, right? It's a blue bird, that means it's a promise. You gotta await that thing. Await that thing. And here's my TCP connection. Remember, there's another abstraction with RabbitMQ, which is called a channel, which is just one channel that goes in your connection. So you can create, I don't know how what's the maximum number of channels per connection, but you, you have to create a channel because that this the channel of communication. So that's not enough. So let's create a channel. How do you create a channel? Again, you await a connection dot create channel. That sounds not hard at all. Okay, that creates also, that's a promise base. So that means it will be awaited. If there is a rejected promise, we gonna go here. You can use then dot then, uh, up to you guys. But here's the thing. Now we have a channel. What do we do, right? The idea here is we gonna publish to a queue, okay? RabbitMQ documentation says the client doesn't know of a queue. I kind of disagree because I write a queue job. I literally specify the queue name in my publisher. That means so don't tell me that the client is not aware of the queue. It just doesn't make any sense to me, right? So the client is aware of a queue, right? But internally, you kind of publish to an exchange. But I don't know. It's just a whole just mumbo jumbo abstraction to me, right? I don't, I don't believe in any of that. So a channel can do something called assert queue. And that assert queue will make sure that your queue exists on the server. And if it doesn't, it's gonna create it for you. So what do we do? We're gonna create a, a queue that's called jobs, right? And let's just use, use the default. There's like, uh, whether you want it durable, that means the persisted disk or not, let's just use the default here, okay? And then const uh, result equal await. Since this is also going through the TCP, you gotta await because it's gonna take some time. Await everything. And it, to know, basically, if you see blue, Bluebird as a result, that means it, it's a promise based, okay? We got a result. Now we got a queue. What do we do? We asserted that we have a queue, right? If you don't do this, you might get an error of the second statement. So here's the thing. What do we do? Now I wanna send something. Send to a queue. What do we send? Which queue? Which queue are sending here? I'm gonna send to the jobs queue. What do you wanna send, son? I'm gonna send an array of buffer, essentially, which is, a, which is like a buffer. And the buffer is, uh, you have to send a buffer, and to do send a buffer, you can do buffer from and then pass a string. So let's just send a JSON object here. And then uh, let's just do a message. What's our message here? What's the message? What are we gonna do? Const message equal, Let's say I'm gonna send a number here, okay? And this is the JSON object with the number two, right? Or just like, I don't know, 19. And then I'm gonna send that JSON object. So you cannot send just the JSON object as, as it is. You have to stringify it. So you're gonna do string JSON to stringify message. And that string will become a buffer. So you obviously need to send a buffer. You can also, if you want just to send text, say hi, ah, you can do that, right? But we wanna be fancier, guys, we wanna be fancy. Okay, we send the job, what else, guys? Is that, el is that all? I think that's it. So we can, if you want to, you can close the connection here, okay? And just be happy. But let's just, just say console.log, uh, let's say job sent successfully. And what's the job? That's the job. What's the job? The job is the number. 
I don't know, you're sending a number and that uh, the process will take that number and process that input, right? Think of it as an input. You're sending a message to the queue. And then one of the your processes will pick that and start processing that, okay? Whether it's going to do whatever, right? Okay, how about we run this thing, guys? Before we run, we have to call this function, right? We never called it. So let's go ahead and run it. And hopefully that works. Let's do uh, I might it might fail because I didn't install. Yep. Cannot find module amqplib. Well, how do we install a module? Very simple, sir. We do npm install amqplib. Just for you to see it, guys. We have to install the library that we use. It doesn't come default by no with Node.js. Okay. Now we have it. Let's run. I'm gonna, by the way, guys, give you the code, so don't have to worry about pausing the video and doing all that stuff, right? So da da, get a channel. After we get the channel, we got the channel successfully. What is the result? What is that? So it gives you back the queue essentially. So we can print that queue if you want, okay? And then that sends to the job, and then we say job sent successfully, and then obviously my debugger still running because we didn't kill the connection, right? So it might be a good idea just to kill the connection afterwards. Okay, so we submitted something to the queue. How about we consume it, guys? So let's create another, another one, right? Another one, consumer.js. Who is a consumer? It's the same code, almost the same code. So here's what we do. Same, MQ. So it's just, it's just steel code, guys, because it's almost the same but I don't want to do all this mumbo jumbo, right? I don't want to send anything to the queue. I want to do something else, so let's delete that. All right. Okay, so that's, I don't think I need a message because I'm consuming messages here. So we connect to the server. We get the channel because you have to do a channel. By the way, this channel is different than the channel of the publisher. They are completely different channel, right? They are completely different TCP connections to begin with, right? So what I want to do here is we have to keep the consumer alive, unlike the publisher. Publisher, you can actually kill the connection if you want after you're done. But you might want to keep the client, the consumer, happy and dandy. So what do you want to do is a console.log listen uh waiting for messages something like that right we're just waiting for messages but how how do i do how do i get messages well you do this channel dot consume and guess what what do you consume guys you consume a queue and what's the queue name it's called jobs and what do you want to do when you consume a job i want you sir to call this function when a message comes in okay and here's what i want to do i just want to do console.log all right and then just print the message okay and then i'm going to pay attention to what will happen here i'm going to run this thing now i'm going to run the consumer and let's see what will happen this is a debug i put a debug here so after if the after the connection if the server, which is RabbitMQ, sent me as a consumer a message, I am going to get triggered here. And here's what we're going to do. What we're going to do. I just want to print what we got. Oh, we, we went to the publisher for some reason. I don't want that. All right, so let's run my consumer. Ooh, nice. Look at that. So... We got a message. What does this message have? It has a content. That's the buffer we got, guys. Remember, it, we sent a buffer, we get a buffer back. How do we get from the buffer? We get a string back, which is what we're interested in. We're going to talk about that. So it's it's unreadable. So let's make it into, but we didn't, we didn't get the message. That's just pretty cool-ish, guys. All right. So here's what I want to do. If I just started again, what? I thought a queue, when you just read the message, the message is dequeued, right? But every time I restart the consumer, I always get the same message again. 
Let's print it so we can we can see content dot two string. Just print it. Let's see what we what we get as a as a consumer. And look at that. We got the number nineteen. Okay, it's a little bit boring. So let's make it into actual JSON, right? Input equal JSON dot parse, right? How this is how you convert a string back to JSON, baby. We get the JSON and then we do a console dot log received job with input input dot number, right? That's all well, that's the function. And then let's do the fancy text here. Template literal of literals. Alright guys. Let's do that. Consume again. And we got it. We got it. And then we get receive job with input 19. Now you can take that number, query the database, do your thing. And here's the interesting part, guys. The reason we keep receiving the same message over and over and over and over and over again, right, is because we did not tell the server that we have received it as a consumer. That's what's called acknowledgement. And I didn't talk about that, but we're gonna we're gonna talk about it a little bit now. Okay. So what do we do? What do we do? All right. So let's let me first clean up some some stuff, guys. Right? I want to do two certain things. I want to create an a script here, an npm, so that if I do npm run publish, right, I will run node publisher.js. Okay, that's what I want to do. And if someone says consume, I'm gonna do go to node consumer is that what it's called the js okay this way if i do if i go to a terminal how do i clear this thing right if i do a command i do npm run publish i'm going to publish the message okay and let's kill it if i do npm run consume i'm going to consume that message and you can see i received two jobs with the same id because i just published another one Another thing I want to fix here, let's kill this job. In the publish, I want to get, I want to publish a number that the user sends me. How do I do that, right? Uh, as I wouldn't do npm run publish, and then I put a number and that number will be published. This way we are always hard coding the number 19. We don't like that, right? So here's what I want to do. To do that, kind of hacky, but, why not? So do process.argv, and I believe it's the third element is of the input will be the input, right? Because the I think zero is the node.js.exe or whatever uh, in your Mac. What is it called? I forgot. The second thing is the path to the JavaScript. The third thing is the input, right? So if I do that, that will be the input. So let's try it out. So now if I do npm run let's zoom in here so you can see npm run publish eight job sent successfully eight right it's pretty cool if i do npm run consume yay we got 19 19 and eight okay so we keep keep getting these jobs here's the thing now okay so we now have that Let's get out of this and show you that we can actually run it out of the terminal, guys. It doesn't have to be in the Visual Studio Code. So let's go ahead and do something fancier here. I'm gonna create a, a new terminal, right? And let's go ahead and create another terminal here. All right, so I have two terminals here. What we're gonna do here, go to the same folder, which is I think called JavaScript, JavaScript playground, and then it's called RabbitMQ, right? And then what I'm gonna do is npm run, publish seven, and just publish seven successfully. And I'm gonna do here is go to the same folder, JavaScript, JavaScript playground, RabbitMQ, and then npm run, consume, and then we can see that we got all of them now. Okay, so that's just, a, just another way of consuming stuff. Here's the thing, guys. The last thing before we end this video with the exercises, I want to tell the server 
server, please DQ this job because I have processed it. How do we do that? Here's what we do. Go back to the code. The consumer job is to DQ or to acknowledge that they received that job in order for the server to pull it from the queue, okay? And there is a lot of stuff here. This is a complicated topic. Kafka's have their own implementation of how like uh, guarantees of delivery, like uh, at least once or at most once or exactly one, right? So there is like a, a lot of guarantees of that, which I'm not going to go through this because it's just going to get longer and longer, or that would be another topic to discuss. But the RabbitMQ guarantees, I think, at least once delivery or at most once. It cannot guarantee that it, exactly you received it once, right? It's just a little bit tricky stuff that people take uh, PhD in, right? This is really complicated because even above my head, really, it's just really complicated stuff. All right, so here's one thing. If I received a message, I want to acknowledge the message, certain thing. Let's say if the input dot number is equal to equal seven, just like that. I just want to process number seven for some reason, right? I don't want to process all the queues. Go ahead and do channel dot ack. And you can acknowledge everything. You can acknowledge just a certain message. So I'm going to acknowledge this particular message, which is called message, right? When a message is received, if that message is satisfied certain criteria, let's say you went to the database and you processed and you got a successful message, you processed it, you run your Hadoop job, you got all, all of that stuff, you run your... Uh, everything and you got back the results you want the way you want it then you can tell the server it's safe to remove it from your queue and that's what acknowledging me okay let's go ahead and acknowledge this thing only okay seven if i go back here and i say npm run consume you can see that i received job with all of them again but this one was acknowledged but it doesn't show here so now if i kill that consumer and i run another consumer you can see that it's still there this is a problem with it's 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 my problem now. I'm gonna show tell you exactly why. It's a, just a JavaScript it, it's something with JavaScript, right? So go ahead and show. All right, the prob the the reason it was not acknowledged is because I think this is this is a very JavaScripty thing, right? Where I told it, hey, if the number is exactly equal seven and the type is also matching, right? But I bet that this number is actually a string, right? It's not actually a seven. So if I do just double equal, this will work. So let's go ahead and do that, all right? So what, what happens here is equal, equal, the reference quickly, really quick. Triple equal, that means the numbers, the, the values do match without implicit conversion, right? That means if this is a number, the second side has to be a number. If you say just equal, equal, that means this, is true, right? If you do, this is, yeah, let's do this later right now. This is true. But if you do this, this is actually false, right? That's, that's the difference, okay? So now that we actually coursed it, let's go ahead back to the terminal. And clear, npm run consume. And you can see that we have acknowledged it, hopefully this time, run it again. And then it's no longer there. All right, guys. <laughs> Long video, but hope you uh, hope you got uh, some benefit from it. So let's jump back to the slides. Continue this. Give you give you my take onto this technology. Then we can summarize this video. Let's go back. All right, guys. So we finished the consumer. We built the consumer. We built, a, we built an, an asynchronous job system with RabbitMQ, we have a publisher. We have a consumer. We sent a job and we execute and we we'll have all this fancy stuff. And we talked about all the beautiful stuff in RabbitMQ. And here's my thoughts about this technology. It has too many abstractions. And here's the thing my old boss told me. He says, if you building a system with a lot of abstractions and you want to introduce a new abstraction, you got to remove an abstraction. You have to remove something. You cannot have 
this many abstractions. What do I mean by abstractions? Well, let me explain to you, right? When I started research this pro uh, this this technology seriously last week, I was so confused because there are so many terms for this technology. It's a message queue. What the heck are you guys doing? What the heck is a publisher, consumer, channel, exchange? What else? There was like so many things and channel and then connection and then two duplex and then push and pull. So many stuff. And then they are supporting three or four protocols. So there's an advanced message queue protocol and there's the stomp protocol and there's the HTTP protocol. Too many abstractions. You know what you get when you have too many abstractions? You get a complex system and complex system do not scale with a human. We are not designed to work with complex systems. We are not designed. And this is my opinion. Take it with a grain of salt, guys. You might be smarter than I am. But if you're introducing this much complexity, right? I, I even, I don't, I don't remember all the abstractions. This is just a few of the abstractions. I'm pretty sure there are more. And if you're introducing all these abstractions, your system is going to get complex. And if it's good complex, adoptions will slow down. Okay, and that's why I believe RabbitMQ is getting less and less popular with these years. And that, that's one of the reasons, in my opinion. It's just too complex. Does it do the job? Of course it does. But if you figure it out, right? There's like, and I you didn't even go deep into this thing. I was just like, you know what? I'm, I'm just going to scratch the surface. I'm not going to go deep because it's so confusing, guys. Right? So to me, it's a very complex system, right? Another thing I want to talk about here is the posh model. The, the, the decision that RabbitMQ team did says, as a consumer, if you connect to a RabbitMQ server, which is called an exchange, which is as TLT ultimately goes to a queue through a channel. Oh my God, look at all this stuff, right? That's what I'm talking about. Look at how complex the, to talk about things is so much. Look at the HTTP, how simple it is. Request response system over TCP. That's it right? That's a whole internet is running on this thing, guys. Different between this. See how complex this thing is. And I think the RabbitMQ like, community made the same problem with, with the enterprise server bus. It's a little bit better. Enterprise server, sorry, OSB was even worse. It was so complex. And it's just a, an equalizer between whether you want to have a completely open system, extendable, extensible, versus a simple system it's just, that is kind of closed. And I don't mean closed source here, closed in, in the limited functionality that it gives, right? Redis, Redis did this very well, I think. Redis said, hey, it's an in-memory database. Yeah, we can give it durability, but I'm going to give you functionality. Very simple, publish, subscribe, and that's it, right? It's a very limited set of functionality. And Memcached, I didn't research Memcached, but it has the same concept, which is a very simple model. Simplicity rules, guys. So let's talk about push model. So when a consumer consumes a certain queue, RabbitMQ pushes messages. As you as you saw, guys, I didn't ask for it. I didn't actually hey say, hey, do I have a message? Do I have a message? Do I have a message? I, I didn't do that. I just said, hey, by the way, if you got a message, push it. To this function and the function got called and triggered and then we got the results right the problem with this is it does not scale how do you guarantee that the consumer will receive that message right and how do you not overwhelm the consumer because guys remember i am a just poor consumer if you have like thousand messages and you're pushing this this down my throat there's this what is called a backfill problem, I think, where, where as you start pushing more messages, I cannot process them fast enough for you. So now you're kind of putting more work on the server, right, to, to start pushing, start slowing down the pushing process because now you're telling the, you're telling the server says, hey, server, please slow down. That's the option that the RabbitMQ have. I think it's called the maximum something, right? So it's like, hey, by the way, I can only process five messages at a, at a, in a second, right? So don't send me more than five messages. Now you're pushing this complexity to the server 
that's why your server became more complicated and that's an a kind of a com an unneeded complexity on the server side because the server now will start pushing more and more messages to you and they start oh i have oh this consumer is slow this consumer is is fast so i'm gonna pushing more messages to this consumer versus this one it's very complicated kafka i think i agree with what kafka did with this and they said you know what we're not going to do a push model we're going to do a long polling model pull it back push this complexity on the consumer and let the consumer consume whenever they want right whenever they are ready to consume they run into another problem which is the acknowledgement problem which way which they solved in a very smart way i didn't research kafka in detail but when i do and leave a comment in the comment section below if you want to see the kafka message write a kafka video and um uh, I'm really interested to make that video, but I think uh, Kafka did a better job at this by shoving that responsibility to the consumer, to the client, instead of having the server push, push, push messages, right? So th that's what we're doing with the, with the notification system as well. Like why YouTube have problem with notification because of the push system, right? There is always pros and cons with this. Redis picked the push model but i would understand with redis it has limited clients consumers because it's all a back-end technology unlike this this is very front endy the message queue because consumers will immediately consume the red uh, the, the rabbit mq message queue versus redis it's always a caching technology so it is always going to be in the back end deep 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 back end so the number of clients will be limited compared to the number of clients to rabbit mq i might be wrong i might be mistaken but that's my take on it hopefully you guys uh give me your take on it. what do you think right all right guys summary what did we discuss in this video we just got the components right <laughs> I'm not even I don't even remember the components. There are a lot of components, guys. Exchange and and then queues and publisher and consumer and channels and connections and there is other stuff that I didn't discuss by the way, guys, but that we discussed the Rabbit MQ. We discussed how to spin a Rabbit MQ server with Docker. I think this is if you want to try anything, you use Docker all the time. Don't install garbage on your machine, guys. Don't install things and just Take memory. Whenever you install something, piece of technology, do Docker start, RabbitMQ. When you're done, Docker stop, RabbitMQ. So you just, even if you restart your machine, the containers will not start by default. So you kind of save on memory, right? And if you're done with it, Docker RM, RabbitMQ. Oof. Okay. We wrote a publisher, right? We also wrote a consumer. And what we did essentially is just, we, we built a, an asynchronous job system where a publisher publishes a job and the consumer just starts and pick a job and start working on it and then does thing and then produces the output, okay? And I, I finally gave you my thoughts about this technology, guys. Hope you enjoyed this video. I'm gonna see you in the next one. You guys stay awesome. What is going on guys? Uh, my name is Hussein, and in today's video, I'm going to spin up a cloud version of RabbitMQ using the Cloud Advanced Message Queue Protocol. So the Advanced Message Queue Protocol uh, protocol uh, applies for many messaging queues, right? And one software that uses this protocol, as is one protocol, is RabbitMQ. So in this uh, video, I'm going to spin up one RabbitMQ instance on this service and I'm, I'm it's it's very simple and I'm gonna uh, create a publisher and create a new queue on this uh, instance and then start consuming the same instance uh, from a from a consumer that I'm gonna build I'm gonna use node.js to build these applications and this is just to tell you that you don't have to basically spin up these uh, RabbitMQ instances on locally on your machine so you can just uh, use one of these services and it's uh, really uh, nice and easy and how about we jump into it guys all right so i'm gonna go ahead and log in to go to cloudamqp.com and hit enter login and this is my email feel free to email me uh anything any questions i really appreciate all your stuff guys and we go ahead and create a new instance 
And what we're gonna do is gonna call it, I don't know, test. And you can choose any, uh, any plan you want. Free is more than enough, right? I'm just gonna go ahead and select region. East, really where, whatever you wanted this instance to be. Uh, the closest thing is the west. I'm gonna pick it like, I don't know, North Car California. Sure, this is the closest to me because I'm in California. I go ahead and review. And just like that, zero dollar a month. By the way, this, this this is not a sponsor or anything like that. It's just, I just enjoy their services and I, I thought I'll just give them some love and try their service. So go ahead and create instance. And just like that, we have a new server, RabbitMQ Manager. You can go to the RabbitMQ Manager, take a look at that. Obviously, I don't have any queues. I don't have any exchanges. I don't have any channels, nothing, right? So all we're going to do is go to Edit and let's take, take a look at the services. That's the host. That's the host, Baba. And this is the AMQP URL. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this puppy. And let's go to the code, guys. How about that? Go to the code. This is the code, guys. I'm going to share it with you. I have done a RabbitMQ crash course. Go check that video if you want details about what RabbitMQ is, what is all that stuff, what is a channel, what is a connection, talking about all that stuff, where we actually built this application from scratch. But in this video, I'm not going to show you how, uh, how I'm not going to build it from scratch. I'm going to consume this stuff. All right, so publisher. The publisher will publish, will connect to the RabbitMQ server, which is uh, currently is set to my local host. I'm going to change that, and I'm literally going to put this huge URL that I got from the server, right? And going to connect to the server, going to create a channel, because this is like the stream level, it's just like HTTP2, create a channel, and then we can do stuff in this channel. We can have many, many channels. By default, I think the servers give you like around 200 channels by default. That's pretty much uh, for a free version, this is enough, right? We're going to create a new queue called jobs. And we're going to send content to the queue based on whatever the parameter that we send to this application, right? In this case, I'm, I'm going to send a number. And then once this number, we're going to make it into a JSON and then send it back to the server. And then the moment we send it, we close the connection, we close the channel and close the connection. At the other end, I'm going to consume that new content right on the consumer side right how about we connect and test this thing node publisher.js and i'm gonna send the number 107 boom just like that we have connected we have sent the job we have created the job queue because it didn't exist right this is what asserts does and then we sent the queue and then we closed we sent that job an entry to the queue, and then we close the channel and we close the connection. Let's look at the at the dashboard. How do I do go to the dashboard? I'm still figuring this thing out. Robin key manager. All right. Look at that. We got a brand new queue. It's called jobs. How about channels? There's no channels. Weird because yeah, because we just closed the channel, right? And uh, yeah, that's the jobs. There's some content in it, probably, right? This is the queue message. There's one ready, hasn't been, uh, there's no connections and yeah, there's all that stuff. There's one queue, seven exchanges. I didn't create any exchanges. These are the default exchanges, I guess, right? I never used this exchanges in RabbitMQ, so I'm not really familiar with it. But yeah, let's go ahead and play with the consumer side of this. Start consuming this. We'll take this thing consumer and uh yeah you can just uh do the same thing here huh let's connect that's and what do we do we're gonna consume same exact thing right i'm gonna connect create a channel assert that the queue exists right we don't really need the results we're not gonna do anything with the results and then we start consuming. And the moment we consume anything, we receive the job with the number and we print that number. And that's just, this is just, was an, some example with the axe and stuff. I want to acknowledge that stuff, but I'm not going to acknowledge anything. I'm just going to consume and print. Let's go ahead and do that. Node consumer.js. I'm not going to pass anything else. 
When I do that, it's like, look at that. Receive job with input 107, and the connection is still there. I did not close the consumer for some reason, right? I, I, I want to show you that if I go back to the dashboard and go to channels, look at that. We have a channel that is opened. It tells you this is my public IP address. It's dynamic, so don't worry about it. The moment I start, my router is going to give you another uh, stuff. Uh, just generate an random username. That's the that's my local port, apparently. Queues. That's the queues, the high availability queue, and uh, all that stuff. So, yeah. And if I kill my queue, my, my consumer, and I did this, I'm going to receive the same thing. You know why, guys, right? Because we have not told RabbitMQ to actually dequeue that job. However, while I am working on 107, that job 107, if someone else connected to the queue at the same time, what they will do is like, let's do it. How about that, actually? Just node consumer.js. Scrape two connections. Look at that. This, this puppy have, did not get the queue. Did, get, did not get 107 because to rabbit in queue, right? The other puppy is using the 107, right? But the consumer didn't, did not acknowledge it, right? So for all we know, if I kill this connection, I go back, let's see what will happen, right? Look at that. Because the first consumer died, I go to the second consumer, immediately got the job because there's a, hey, Looks like this consumer didn't acknowledge me, right? That's why acknowledgements are very, very tricky to get right, right? So that's why uh, get that thing right, guys. And I talked about this stuff in RabbitMQ. All right, guys. So a very short video to talk about RabbitMQ and how to spin up a RabbitMQ in a cloud uh, version. That's I think that's what, uh, the first video I make on a cloud. I start using the cloud more because it's just very convenient. All right, guys. That's it for me today. Uh, hope you enjoyed this video. Give it a like if you like it. Share it with your friends. I'm going to see you on the next one. You guys stay awesome. What is going on, guys? My name is Hussein. In this video, I want to discuss RabbitMQ and HTTP2. Uh, RabbitMQ, I made a video about RabbitMQ. Check it out, guys, here. It's a very interesting message queue that I have my doubt about, but I a little bit changing my 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 mind about it because it's a really really great tech, and uh, it had a feature that I fall in love the moment I read about it, and it's called channels. And let's talk about that a little bit, and then compare it to HTTP two streams that also we're gonna talk about it. All right. So when you have a um, a RabbitMQ server or, or a broker right here, right? And we have a client, which is usually called a consumer. The client establishes a TCP connection between itself and the server. And we know how TCP works, guys, check it out. There is in the client library for RabbitMQ, they add some abstraction called the channel. And the reason they did that is like every request you wanna send to the server, you have to specify the channel ID and they have headers for every request they send tagged with the channel ID. And you might say, why do you want to do this? This is so awesome technology. The reason is, instead of having multiple clients to establish a multiple TCP connections to the server, you now have one TCP connection and all of these requests are funneled in the same TCP connection. And now you can send a request and expect a response back even if that request is already, you're sending another request in the same TCP channel because uh, they are very uniquely tagged with the channel ID. So now you can simultaneously send requests on the same TCP connection. And that's exactly how HTTP2 works, guys. The idea of streams. Browsers before HTTP2, what did they do? Remember, every request you send, you can only send one request at a time. And you better send one request at a time because you cannot we don't know that response that comes back, which request was it for? Because it's just garbage data coming out and in, right? So they made the decision way back to say, oh, send one request and 
wait for the response to come back and that request must be for that that response must be for that request and so on that's that's called essentially head of line blocking so it's like so that the rest of the request are blocked until that response is actually the first response received and that's a problem right and that same problem exists with tcp and any request response system so what RabbitMQ did is they added this abstraction of the idea of channels in the TCP connection. So every request is almost uniquely identified in the channel itself. That is very similar to the idea of HTTP2 streams, which we talked about it right here. Go check it out. So HTTP2 streams serves a very similar idea. You have one TCP connection instead of six, like what the browsers used to do in HTTP one. And then if you make a GET request, they are tagged with a stream ID. If you make a POST request, simultaneously, they are tagged with a stream ID. If you make another GET request to fetch an image, if you make another request to fetch a CSS or, or an HTML file or a JavaScript file, they are tagged uniquely with a stream ID, very similar to the channel ID, and they are shoved into the TCP connection, right? And now when you come back, the, the response that comes back is tagged with a stream ID. So you know, oh, so you know that, oh, this, this response is actually for this stream. All right, so you actually can assemble things in the client. So it doesn't matter what the order comes back. If this comes back or this comes back first, and it doesn't really matter so even if there are some delays right so why i made this video is like i'm not sure who actually invented this idea of of multi-concurrent tagging of request so rabbitmq or http2 or speedy google was invented this idea right so i was just like i'm just we're very curious about this so both obviously come back to that final my final point is both http2 and RabbitMQ suffer from a very severe problem, which is the TCP. It's a, it's a problem with the TCP itself, right? And the problem with TCP is like if you sing a packet and the packet is damaged or haven't received by the server and there's no acknowledgement, and that's a packet, right? It's just a packet. The client always retransmits that packet back, right? And that causes any other requests, packets that you are about to send to have wait for an acknowledgement to be received from the server. This is at the packet level, guys. This is not at the stream level. So if you're, that means if stream one technically didn't receive an acknowledgement, stream two cannot even be fired to the server, which is very bad right? That's a problem with TCP. That's a very, and, and that problem carries with RabbitMQ. It's a very similar problem. And that's why guys, Quick was invented to say, so you know what, we cannot rely on, on the idea of retransmission to put it at, the, at that lower level of, uh, of our architecture. You cannot implement that at the lower level. So what they said is that I'm not gonna, we're gonna not gonna use TCP for retransmission. We're gonna use the bare bone UDP, which doesn't have any of this feature. It just sends a request and relies on the higher level of uh, application to actually does that retransmission and verification of the packets. And that's what Quick did. Quick implemented, re-implemented TCP by the higher level and they built in stream in it. So now you can use one logical connection there are no connections in udb so they create a kind of a similar U logical connection and now you can send as many requests as you want and they are tagged with a stream id and if one stream had a bug in it i don't know the packet didn't receive correctly that the quick client will only retransmit that it will not stop the rest of the streams right all the all the channels if you want to call them right the rest of the stuff will just go normally right because they have nothing to do with the first one because if the stream 2 is good or stream 3 is good and stream 1 is bad 
Why do you have them to suffer, right? Like what HTTP does to do, right? HTTP 2, if stream 1 is bad or has a, I don't know, it was transferred in the ocean, the fiber was caught, right? The stream 1 will, will suffer and stream 2 or stream 3 or stream 5, all the streams will suffer. So you will feel the slowness with HTTP 2. That's the problem with this, right? So quick solves this problem very elegantly at that level and now http3 is built as a very thin layer on top of quick that uses all these protocols that brings me back to the farm my final point is like i think most message queues right and databases and protocols should start using queues to be honest right because that solves a huge problem with tcp tcp had this problem with retransmission and the packets right and now concurrent sending concurrent requests at the same time and that just magnificently quick solves this problem for you right today i just wanted to talk about rabbit mq and, and the idea of channels and then uh, HTTP2 and then how both of these are having this problem now solves with Quick and Quick have their own problem. I'm not going to discuss it in this channel, but definitely I'm going to make a video dedicated for Quick. But I was very interested to know that the similarities between RabbitMQ as its own from scratch protocol building with the channels very similar to the HTTP2 protocol. All right, guys. Uh, I'm going to see you in the next one. Leave a like if you like this video. Subscribe. And what do you guys think? What is the future protocol? Do you think Quick will hold to its glory? And it's going to become really well-known protocol that is used everywhere? Because I am I have a good feeling. In the next 10 years, Quick is going, to, is going to become a big thing. There's one problem that I'm, going to, I'm not going to mention here. It's essentially the UDP and how the internet treats UDP. But that's for another video. Like this video if you like it. I'm gonna see you in the next one. You guys stay awesome. What's going on, guys? My name is Hussein, and welcome to another episode of Wireshark Them All. And today we're gonna Wireshark Rabbit MQ. So we made a video about Rabbit MQ, guys. Check out that course discussing this tech discussing this beautiful message queue that uses the advanced message queue protocol and uh, as we did with the previous uh, episode with Wireshark we're gonna establish a connection between a client which is this Node.js application that connects to an advanced message queue protocol server which is a rabbit mq server in this instance that i spun up in a cloud-based architecture and i'm gonna make another video showing you how did i how did that it was literally two clicks i love this stuff and I, the reason i needed to do that because i cannot run a, a rabbit mq locally on my mac and run wireshark the same machine because i, I won't capture those packets right and uh yeah, so how about we jump into it, guys? So here's what I have. I have a RabbitMQ server running on the cloud. And uh, I am, this piece of application literally connects, creates a channel. And I described in that video what, a, what is the difference between a connection and a channel, right? It's like in HTTP2, you have the connection and streams very very similar right and then uh, i'm not sure who came up with this idea first <laughs> so yeah similar like even ssh same thing right their idea of connection and channel so we can allow multiplexing essentially all right so the channel and then what we do here is we create a channel and then immediately in this channel we create a queue and then we send a job to the queue and this is basically whatever we pass in in the in the in the buffer uh, I'm gonna say hi for example and that's it and just we print something and then immediately we close the channel we close the connection and I'm gonna capture the whole thing right how about we jump into it so create a brand new terminal do node publisher.js that's the file and uh, the source code will be available guys for you I'm gonna say hi boom so he's gonna know. It just prints it and immediately quits so let's go to Wireshark and see what we captured Here's our shot, guys. And I did a filter just so I can 
only filter between my server, my IP address client, and the server, which is, uh, that's the, wherever this thing is. I just pinged the host and then got the IP address and literally filtered the event. So let's go, let's go through all this garbage. <laughs> Let's see if we can explain all that stuff, guys. How about we do that? First three things, guys. We know what this is, right? This is the client is start with 10 and the server is 72, just for simplicity. We know these what these three things are, right? Sin, Synac, ACK. That's the three-way handshake to establish a TCP connection. That's just to prove that uh, RabbitMQ uses TCP. I and mean, That's not bad. That's just something we need to be aware of. So that's the three-way handshake to establish the TCP connection, right? Then we know that uh, SEN, SENAC, and ACK. And here's the first content that the client sends. Protocol header says, hey, uh, since the RabbitMQ uses the advanced message queue protocol, the first thing is SEN says, hey, I'm using the advanced message pro queue protocol, right? And uh, this is my minimum version. And this is my maximum version version 1.9, whatever, right? 0.9 actually, right? That's the version of the AMQP, 091, right? And uh, the server acknowledges that packet. And then once we acknowledge that packet, it says, okay, I got your request and now I think we're good. Let's establish a logical connection. And that's, uh, look who's, who's initiating this. It's very interesting guys, right? That was, I believe, a result of the connection when we created the connection, right? The first thing. But the server responds like, okay, I'm ready to establish the connection for you, right? So now it establishes, it's just to us at that level, it's just a bunch of data, well, to the to the TCP stack. But we're sending connection.star and look at how beautiful this thing is. Wireshark actually shows us this stuff. It actually doesn't decrypt, it's just, it's already plain text. I'm not using any encryption here. So it knows, it says, hey, this is the version, this is the capabilities, and that's all the things I support, and here, let's start the connection. And the client acknowledges that request, that packet, and then this, the client now sends its version of connection start okay, I'm happy with everything you did, server, here's the things I support, uh, here's my configuration and let's go ahead and establish a connection, right? So technically, if you think about it, we have a TCP connection, but this is the logical advanced message queue protocol that, that RabbitMQ uses to establish a, phys a logical connection on top of the physical TCP connection. The server says, okay, let's tune things a little bit, right? And you might say, why do we need to tune if we can we do the tuning in this? That's kind of a, um, optimization that the advanced message queue can do, do, I guess. But for some reason, we're doing it in another step, but sure. So I'm doing a tuning and here's the thing. Channel maximum, right? The server says, I only support 200 channels. <laughs> and that's a good idea for, uh, for a cloud application because they don't want to make it in like a thousand channels. Otherwise, they, they're going to deplete a free. I'm using the free tier, right? And this is the maximum frame size. If each, each frame that you send, that's the maximum I can support. And here's the heartbeats. Like we're going to ping each other every 120 seconds to see if we are alive or not, right? So that's the thing. So... The, ser the, cl the client acknowledges that packet, that connection tune, and then the server, the client sends back connection tune okay. And here's the thing. The client agreed on the 200, the ag client agreed on the heartbeat, but he didn't agree on the frame max. He says, okay, <laughs> dude, your frame max is so big, son. I'm going to only send you four, 496. That's the only thing I um, support. Awesome. Awesome. So the server says, acknowledges that. And now we're actually opening the connection. See, we didn't even start this thing yet. So we're opening the connection. And this thing is like, look at this. This is now the client actually opening the connection. That was just starting the connection. Now we're actually opening the connection for to send to send data. We acknowledge the server acknowledges that connection open. 
and then the server sends back a connection open okay so if we get any errors we will see these errors and uh, yeah it even sends back ho known hosts that's if it's null i guess that's the only host that supports in case if you want to do like a load balancing or stuff like that uh client acknowledge that now channel open let's look at the code we're right here guys now <laughs> all of that stuff was here right now we're here okay line 13 look at that stuff <laughs> now the client opens a channel and and the channel what is a channel this is is like a strip in a connection that we allow uh, basically multiplexing right so we can have multiple threads in the same process mul sending in parallel multiple packets on the same tcp connection right so this is a great idea and people have been doing it for years retransmission something happened here apparently the client retransmitted some packet that had been lost or because either we didn't get an acknowledgement or something bad happened, right? So it's sent back. And the server replies with share channel, channel open. Let's open, let's go ahead and open that connection. And we, we don't have a channel ID for some reason, right? And uh, yeah, looks like I have not specified a channel ID. I have an option if I want to, to I believe to specify a channel ID, huh? Hmm. Maybe, maybe not. I remember there was like an uh, idea to specify a channel ID, but looks like uh, there isn't. Hmm? Never mind. Acknowledgement from the client that we received the channel open. And here's the thing, guys. We're declaring a queue. Now the client is about to create a new queue. That's the queue, right? This is it. We're asserting the queue so we can create a new queue on the server and since i created this before that queue already exists so uh, a bunch of free transmission we're gonna ignore this stuff right because uh, that's what happened when you connect things to the internet dupe acts stuff like that and then we come back and then he's like queue declare okay that's the from the server says okay i got you this queue already exists and uh Go ahead and this is, we have nine messages in the queue <laughs> in this currently because I, I used this queue before to do stuff in it. Uh, the client acknowledges the queue. And here's the thing, we're going to publish. Now we are where? We're sending content. We're sending the high, which is, this is two letters, right? Two letters, two characters, right? Let's, let's see if this is, is actually there. And the payload... Where's the high? There you go. I actually send a JSON. It says number high. Why is it number high? Let's see. What did, what did I do? I forgot what I did the code. Oh, look at that. I'm sending a JSON of message object. What is this? Oh, there you go. Look at this. I'm sending. I forgot. I wrote this code a long time ago. So it's a, it's a JSON object with a number. I'm supposed to be numbers, but for some reason I sent high. Sure. Right. So we're sending a JSON number and high. <laughs> Doesn't matter, guys. You get the idea. All right. So we're sending that. And now we're acknowledging the server acknowledges that we got the publish. And now here's the cool thing, guys. The client closes the channel, right? Right here. We're closing the channel. But the server didn't respond with anything. And that's a very, very interesting thing, guys right if because when you publish something and that's one powerful feature in advanced message queue protocol when we publish the only thing we need to know that our content has been published to the queue is this puppy the acknowledgement and that's it that's a lower level thing that we don't have control as developers as programmers back and engineers we don't have any control over this thing right so it's just the moment we get the acknowledgement we know it's 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 in the server and i don't really care about this the reply because we're publishing a queue it's going to be at the other end of the consumer to consume that stuff it's not our job anymore we close the connection the server acknowledges the close that the server closes the channel from its side right and then 
acknowledge, the client acknowledges the close and then what is it so the client now physically let's say logically closes the connection right because you can open and close as many channels as you want while keeping the connection alive right you can have many channels in this name tcp connection and no i shouldn't say tcp connection you can have many channels in this logical connection that is actually just one physical tcp connection does that make sense guys and then yeah we closes this poppy right the sir the client says okay i'm done even with this uh, connection just like let's go ahead and close the connection right and uh, the server says okay here's the interesting thing this is the delayed beautiful acknowledgement part of this thing what happened here is when we closed it if the server can it start instead of acknowledging the close data packet it waits since i'm about to close it anyway let's wait let's not acknowledge that stuff and let's send you the data with the acknowledgement so if we look at the acknowledgement we say okay we're acknowledging this the same content right here right so if you look at this it should be the next number is 569 and if we look at the acknowledges is also 569 so yeah we're acknowledging and sending the data that's the best thing that we can do if possible and that's where a good well-written server uh, it shines really right and that's the back end is written very well we're acknowledging and sending that data at the same time if we can do that low level thing we'll see great performance despite some dupes and stuff like that happen in the internet we cannot control that obviously but what happened here where the client acknowledges the close okay which is this response from the server and here's the thing who's initiating the close hmm the client is initiating the close. Awesome. So if the client is initiating the close, right? And uh, <laughs> look at that. Some error happened. It got reset, right? So, so far from test to multiple tests to RabbitMQ, I never seen a clean close of the TCP connection. And I'm not sure why. And we can dig deeper in, into this thing. And I, I, I'm probably going to need some help from the network engineers because... I don't know why these resets happen, but when the moment you see reset, that means something uh, wacky happened in the internet and, and uh, the packets went out of order and, and uh, we couldn't close the connection in a clean manner, so we reset. So to the client and the server, this is an error. We close the connection in error, despite me just closing it in neatly, to be honest, right? I just immediately opened and closed it, right? And uh, if I look at the code, I also awaited. I made the mistake of the I I I didn't have these puppies, right? I didn't have awaits. I'm I mistakenly didn't that. And when you do don't do that, since this is asynchronous code, we're gonna do that. And since this is asynchronous, we're gonna send the code and immediately go to the next thing and close the connection. We don't wait for a result from that, right? And then when when you do that, bad things happen, man. Right, because you start closing the connection and, and before actually receiving content from the server, it's going to be uh, awful. All right, so that's uh, that's essentially RabbitMQ wireshark. I hope you enjoyed this video, guys. Give it a like. Share it with your friends. I'm going to see you on the next one. You guys stay awesome. Goodbye. What should our wireshark next? Let me know in the comment section below. Goodbye. What is going on guys? My name is Hussein and this is a very interesting article from DoorDash. Uh, they're basically uh, at a food delivering service um, here in the US and uh, they have a very interesting piece of article here. They're moving from RabbitMQ to Apache Kafka. Uh, back-end technologies to back-end technologies that we discussed in this channel guys so check out the rabbit mq video right here also you can check out the apache kafka video right here if you want to learn deep dive uh, around an hour video detailing both of those tech so guys that let's be clear about this guys that does not mean rabbit mq is bad right 
Let's be clear about that. And even after I read the article, I still think that is very specific use case to do DoorDash that just didn't work with RabbitMQ, right? So the outages being caused with RabbitMQ, I think it has to do with something that I'm going to discuss in, in this article, right? I'm going to reference the article here. You guys go ahead and read it. I'm going to summarize some of the stuff here. So I'm going to summarize the article, what, what uh, the DoorDash engineering team did to overcome these problems and, and uh, why did they choose Kafka. They did a great job, guys, detailing the problem, detailing the, the, the scalability and availability problem they have, detailing even the solution. They, they even came up with a proposed different solutions and pros and cons. I like that. The only, uh, if I'm going to critique this article, is that I'd like to see a little bit more details, technical details, that is. Yeah, even that, yeah, I, I would like to see. I had a lot of questions that I just couldn't find answers for in the article itself, right? Uh, and I'm going to get into these uh, um, in this video. So guys, they, Rabbit, uh, not Rabbit, DoorDash have a back-end task processing, specifically an asynchronous task processing uh, system. Eh, exactly, that's it. An asynchronous task processing so we talked about that a little bit guys we built one actually we built one very very simple one with rabbit in q if i if i if i remember correctly and and what that what does that mean right what is what is an asynchronous task processing really mean right so that means synchronous versus asynchronous we talked about these two guys what is the difference between these two techniques check out this video if you want to learn more about it. but Synchronous is that I'm going to make a request and I'm going to sit down and wait, right, for the result. And this waiting doesn't have to be blocking necessarily, right, because I could wait in an event loop, right? I, I can have an event loop that, okay, I'm waiting for a result, a, a callback to give me the result, but I'm doing my, my other stuff as well. That's, that's how JavaScript and Node.js works, right? Even that, that's the synchronicity for it. Asynchronous means I'm going to make a request and I'm going to get back a response immediately from the service, from the server, from the backend, but that service is queued that job that task is actually not executed immediately but it is essentially queued to get executed at a later, a later time right that's, that's asynchronous processing here so let's be very clear about that asynchronous in the front end is a little bit different from asynchronous in the back end right we're talking about the back end here it's all back end we're back end here right guys so if i if i if i make an asynchronous job that uh, means i'm going to execute a request and i'm going to immediately immediately get a response back saying here's your job id come back and check with me later right so that's that's in a nutshell doesn't mean this is exactly what's happening here but that's what an asynchronous system is and then once the job actually finishes we write the result back into some sort of a, a place. It could be the same message broker, could be could be a desk, could be another service. Who cares, right? And that that basically picks up the result, and you can do stuff with it, right? So that's that's what asynchronous task process. And you, they have tons of this stuff. They have a lot. Of, what? How much did they say there? There was a number, nine hundred different asynchronous task ordering merchant order check out you can imagine right all of this stuff you want to get a response back to the server, to the user as much as fast as possible right let's execute a request get the result that okay i have submitted your order i am processing it go do something else right 
That's how the backend works. Yeah, the backend is executing it, right? Versus synchronicity where you the backend is actually serving you and, and executing you and you're waiting for it. So here's a technology that I never heard about before. Celery, guys. And you might you might laugh now because I, I have never heard of Celery before. So Celery is exactly does the job that I talked about here. It is it's an it's an asynchronous and synchronous task processing software. It has nothing to do with brokers, has nothing to do with messages. It is it is it is it is a software written in Python that you submit task for it, it spins up a thread, executes the task for you, and then gets you back the results. So that it runs, you can either run it in a, in a single node or multiple node, and that's it, right? Celery, and that's that's one critique that I'm going to say that maybe it's well known. That's why they didn't mention this in the article. I wish they talked about more about this, their existing architecture. I felt that they didn't clarify that, to be honest, right? They jumped into the problem, but they didn't draw... Uh, diagrams of their existing architecture. So uh, that, if, that, if I'm going to critique it, that will be one critique in this article, right? I'd love to see their existing architecture instead of the problems, right? Make sense? So they have Celery as this asynchronous job executing, but they pull the jobs and 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 all these messages from a broker because Celery can be actually... Uh, connected uh, actually let, let's let's pull it uh, where is salary let's go to wiki yeah so salary can be optionally connected to a message broker and the recommended is RabbitMQ and or redis right because redis have this pop sub system right RabbitMQ is also there they are not supporting kafka as far as we learned from this article beautiful article guys beautiful good job saba and ashwan good job guys so, so this is the current architecture. Celery as this task execution system written in Python, and then RabbitMQ as the back end that, that basically submits, acts like a queue, basically. The message broker that submits to the exchange and then writes to the queue, and then a Celery agent, a Celery worker will pick up a new job, will pick up a new task and from RabbitMQ and start processing this stuff. So they're using Celery as the vehicle, right? For, all, for the longest time, I didn't think, and I still believe we don't really need that extra layer, right? I would have built this myself if I were right. And I, I, I built a, a task manager before, right, in my, in my career. So I would I would be basically use a queue. I still looking for a simple queue that does only a queue, right? I couldn't find one yet. RabbitMQ is, I had my little bit of uh, of critique, let's say for RabbitMQ. <laughs> if you if you know this channel, I talked about a little RabbitMQ. I like this architecture, but I think they went too far, right? They started with being a queue, but then moved to a pop subsystem. Right, Kafka started as as a streaming pop sub system, and 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 that's 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 the good thing, right? RabbitMQ is trying to do so much; they're trying to expand. When you try to expand, you don't have focus anymore, right? And that your software becomes a little bit complex, and it suffers. I feel MongoDB is headed the same route, in my opinion. I know, I know, some of you like MongoDB and NoSQL. I have nothing against those. Right, but I just think if you're starting with NoSQL and you are NoSQL and you're schemaless, then trying to expand to become relational is a little bit weird, right? You're trying to solve different problem. Now you're trying just to steal to eat from the market share from the relational, right? So that's why uh, MongoDB is. Uh, I know I'm going off the road, but I'm I'm just talking about the RabbitMQ. It's the same so, 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 the same problem that I have with these systems. Right. MongoDB now started supporting transaction, full asset transactions. Why? Right. Just because people were complaining that, oh, I would not move to Mongo because it's not relational, right? If it's not transactional. So they built in transactions on this. And they have some other problems like limiting the transactions and stuff because of that, right? I think they, they're heading into the wrong direction, if you ask me. MongoDB. 
But still, it's a great database. The engineers behind it are so smart, solving extremely hard problems. They're solving transaction across shard, which is, which is nuts, right? This is nuts. It's, it's a very difficult problem to solve. But my point with RabbitMQ is the same, right? RabbitMQ is, from the name, it's a message queue, but it does so much other stuff. Well, there's these exchanges and stuff, right? Awkward. But regardless, it doesn't mean RabbitMQ is bad. I just my opinion, and you can have your own opinion. So Celery and RabbitMQ are two systems. And what happens if you include too, too many systems, guys? Right? Complexity, right? This is not a system written by you. It's an open source, yeah, but you have dependency on this. You have dependency on this. And this is what happened. This is what causes the problems. They start to see a spike, and you can read this article, a spike spike on RabbitMQ. RabbitMQ will just go down because it will hit a limitation in RabbitMQ and it's called the high surge churn churn excessive connection churn. They will hit this. Excessive connection churn, guys. Let's read this. This is what they hit. Uh, the DoorDash team. The, what, ha what, what happened is like they will get a lot of orders, a lot of these execution and, and salary jobs will just skyrocket and it will start shoving lots of jobs to RabbitMQ and execute, not just publishing, consuming and publishing, both, right? And RabbitMQ hit this. High connection churn. Let's read this a little bit. Let me zoom so you can read uh, clearly. A system is said to have high connection churn when its rate of newly opened connection is consistently high and, and its rate of closed connection is also consistently high. What do we know on the back end, guys? Why did we build HTTP 1.1? Because HTTP 1.0 had the same problem. HTTP 1.0 we're trying to, to, to be so precious, saving our precious memory. So we said every request opens a connection and, and, and sends the request and then closes the connection. We regretted this decision immediately because it was a bad idea. Opening and closing connection is bad. It looks like from what I thought, and it's not clear, salary is the cause of this thing. Salary is every time you want to open connect to the RabbitMQ, they open a new TCP connection, which we talked about, and then they send the request and then they close it. L resulting in, in, in a churn of closing and opening, closing and opening. You shouldn't be opening and closing connections, in my opinion. Keep them alive. Why did we have HTTP 1.1, HTTP 2? Keep those dang connections alive. Keep them running. And that's the problem of using existing software and not building your own. And I'm, I'm not saying don't use existing software, of course, but. And again, I don't know if this salary is the problem. I never used it, but it seems like it from the description here, from what I'm reading. And guys, if you, if anyone from DoorDash here and I said anything that is dumb or incorrect, correct me, guys. I would love to learn more detail. I have, I'm, I'm starving for details here. I'm starving. I'm starving. I need to learn more. Is salary, can we, I need to know what is the architecture between salary and RabbitMQ here? And why are we so chatty when it comes to that? Because RabbitMQ connections are not cheap. They are very similar to HTTP2. Very similar. And we know how expensive HTTP2 when it comes to CPU usage, right? We know that because all these streams, which RabbitMQ have, it's called channels, right? All these channels are in the same TCP connection. So RabbitMQ team, I loved that in RabbitMQ. I love their design. And I don't know who came up with this idea first, RabbitMQ ad, as the advanced message queue protocol or HTTP2 from Speedy Google. I don't know who came up with this stream or channel. I prefer the word channel over stream. I hate the word stream in, in HTTP2. I don't like it one bit. I think it's, it doesn't have anything to do with stream. It's 
it's a channel i love the word channels more clear if you tell me it's channel it's called channel in ssh it's called channel rabbit mq speedy decided to call his stream okay whatever all right so i think that that's that's what caused basically the problem and you have a huge churn in in rabbit mq causes what it causes downtime it causes basically you cannot accept more because the, the 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 single master we can't say master anymore uh the leader node in rabbit mq is busy doing closing and opening connection which is extremely expensive and i and i that it's even more expensive in case of Rabbit MQ because they have the, the the logical connection idea of channel. So I bet that's even made the problem even worse. So yeah, availability, scalability. So they 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 clarify these problems in details. They talk about all that stuff. They were using Python, which is which is not a bad idea. I think it's just it's just any language will run into the same problem if you ask me. And uh, Here's another thing, guys. Here's another thing I forgot to mention. So salary, talked about that. Sudden burst of traffic would leave RabbitMQ in a downgraded state where task consumption was significantly lower than exception. In our experience, uh, this could only be resolved with a RabbitMQ bounce. Wow, that's just unacceptable. RabbitMQ has a concept of flow control where it will reduce the speed of connections which are published too quickly so that that queues can keep up flow control guys it's a it's a very similar concept in tcp tcp have flow control quick that's quick they built i believe they built the flow control concept in quick yes so rabbitmq also implement an application level flow control you know which makes sense you don't want to shove thousands and thousands of packets all at once right you need to taste the network see if it just like tcp slow start which we talked about right here this is very similar i believe right which i i, I never knew that rabbit you had a flow control kudos i love it so yeah so that's why it, it is it is a how what is, what's the english word for it double edged sword yes it is a double edged sword so it could, it could hurt and it's good it's beneficial network latencies yeah but it will kill the system otherwise so they talk about all this stuff here consumers the salary consumers to kafka's uh no kafka rabbit mq we don't talk about kafka here so all this stuff they they propose so many other solutions uh and then they they say okay let's switch up since salary support redis let's switch up redis instead of rabbit mq I don't know if that will help. Maybe it will, because what does Redis use? Yeah, Redis uses the RESP protocol, right? Their their own custom one. I have no idea if they're using channels or not. So maybe if Celery is doing the same thing, closing and opening connection with every single request and consumption, then I think you're gonna have the same problem, right? That's the what they call the harakiri. That's the closing and reopening harakiri connection churn. Does not significantly degrade Redis performance. Okay, all right. So they actually tested this thing. I like it. So they said that the, the closing and connection churn is not a problem in Redis, probably because it's not it's not the chan uh, it's not it's not a, a, the advanced message queue protocol in RabbitMQ is different than redis right it's a completely different protocol so then maybe it's a little bit more lenient but to me i would solve the root problem why we do we have this churn of connections you open a connection open a connection is so expensive open a connection is so so expensive especially if it's tcp what other connections do we have i mean quick we don't have that yet but yeah opening tcp connection is so expensive guys three-way handshake and then they didn't mention if it's tls or not but yeah if you have tls on top of that if you have tls 1.2 sheesh i bet it's secured they didn't mention anything about tls did they nope see this is what i crave i crave information guys 
Guys, I crave information. I need more information. There is not enough details here. So yeah, look, is the architecture between Celery and RabbitMQ, is this secure? Doesn't mention, because if it's secure, this will compound the problem even worse. And if it's TLS 1.2, it's even, even worse than that. Because we have like what? Two round trips plus the handshake, and then you close it. That's why we need to understand how backend works, guys. I, 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 I keep saying this in this channel. I keep saying it. Fundamentals, guys. Fundamentals, not tools. Do not use tools. And obviously, I'm talking to, 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 to my community here. I know, not DoorDash engineering per se. But yeah, fundamentals are so important. Forget about this, all these tools. Once you understand how stuff basically work, you, 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 you are unstoppable. You just understand everything. You just need to understand the basic fundamentals. You build this stuff on top. You, you know what you're using. So they switched it to Kafka. And I believe, first of all, they built a, a, a smart Python interface on top of their salary uh, workers so that they, they kind of canary deploy the thing between RabbitMQ and Kafka, right? Wait a second. I think they, they removed Celery altogether, did they? Yes. Because you, can, you cannot connect Celery directly to Kafka, as far as I know. So they built their own custom uh, system from scratch, right? That's the MVP. They built it from scratch. It's a custom solution, right? Is that what they I, 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 Custom, custom. I read the word custom here. Custom solution. There you go. They build their own custom switch. Again, guys, if, correct me if I said anything wrong with that, right? So even that custom solution, they still had a problem with Kafka, guys, right? So before we go to the problems of Kafka, they started just canary deployed between Kafka and RabbitMQ. So they shifted all the load from Kafka, RabbitMQ to Kafka. I'd like to see how did the system behave without Kafka and the custom solution, salary out of the way. How did that behave? Did they try that? Because I have a strong feeling that salary is the problem here. I don't know why. Again, guys, I don't I don't know. I don't know. I might I'm I don't want to be that guy, but it feels like salary is the problem here. Custom solution, very thin layer job processing and just use RabbitMQ as a broker. I still don't understand why do we need the salary as a software? When was it built? I'm just interested, when was salary built, right? It's like, was it before the idea of broker? Was it was designed to solve certain problems, I think? I don't know. I know Instagram uses uh, salary. I read this somewhere here, but I still don't know. Um, again, guys, I never used Celery before, so I don't know. Let me know if any of you guys use Celery. That would be interesting to know, right? If, if you guys have similar problem. But yeah, just because uh, uh, DoorDash moved to Rabbit Kafka does not mean it. Kafka is better than RabbitMQ. I mean, Kafka is, is, is way feature, feature wise, is better than RabbitMQ. That's for, for sure. Just because of the design decision, and we talked about that. I'm not gonna dive deep into that again. But the design choices of seamless adoption, guys. So they started sh shifting everything back to Kafka, all right. And they they hit some problems. They hit some problems, which is called the head of line blocking problem, guys. And I was surprised when I saw this. Like, wow, how can I never thought about that? Because we talked about cons consumer group in Kafka. Check out the Kafka video, and and you can use the ch YouTube chapters to jump into consumer group to read exactly. You're gonna understand. Is it? Whoa, exactly. You'll understand why this happened. So, consumer group guys is the ability to. to is is Kafka's solution for parallelism, so that you can spin up. In number of consumers in a given consumer group and what will happen here is every consumer will get one partition and one partition only right and 
and and yeah so that's that's this uh, that's the thing that's that's the idea of uh, kafka topic partitioning right so so that means also means if you have a consumer that is just a slow consumer then and this is a slow message this consumer is just taking a long time processing this message for any any reason right then you have to come it's like okay first of all if this is slow then the whole thing is just blocked right this is called head of line blocking we have the same problem with with http uh in pipelining http 1.1 right where you send a request you cannot execute any of the other unless the 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 nth request is executed right it's just ordered so that's the same problem here right see the fast messages are okay slow messages is the problem and 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 now we start questioning why do we have a slow message versus a fast message message right why would an order one order take more to execute than another they should be identical right it's not that again I, i'm i'm not 100 percent sure but if, if, if an order is an order if i submit a thousand if i want thousand burgers from in and out versus one it's an order who cares if it yeah i'm not it's not like me i'm gonna make the burgers just in and out so yeah i'd like to know more about why what is a slow message per se i'd like to know more about that so yeah solving these kind of problems will be interesting i'm just very interested so yeah parallelism and then they're going through all that stuff so they they started to break down the 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 consumer and trying to find other solutions they're still 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 working into these problems guys so i'm gonna i'm gonna leave uh, i'm gonna leave this uh, to you guys it's a uh, it's an interesting read definitely i loved i'd like to see more and more articles like this written in a very detailed manner uh it could be just me i'd love to see more details in my opinion because like as i read i have more questions but yeah, it's well written. Good job, good job, guys. I love it. Saba and Ashwan, excellent job, guys. Excellent. I love it. This is a great article. Uh, we need more visibility like this. We need to know real people, real people, <laughs> real businesses uses using these back end technologies and how this uh, technologies are performing. Right. Again guys again i'm gonna repeat it for the for the millionth time does not mean that apache kafka is always the right solution to you does not mean rabbit mq is a bad solution to you although most of your comments guys on my rabbit mq video was like yeah you're right rabbit mq we we moved from rabbit mq because it was so complex again guys that rabbit mq i used it at my work and i built a course i made a video talking about RMQ and I made a video talking about Kafka and Kafka if you, if you start with Kafka it's it's it's, it's way more how do I say well, I can't say them complex it's more intertwined compared to RabbitMQ right but I came in with RabbitMQ a little bit confused I saw there are so many abstractions that kind of uh, the barrier to entry becomes real high and, and learning RabbitMQ becomes real difficult to the amount of features that it have and that's that was my problem with it again i might change my mind anything that i say in this channel i could tomorrow then i could definitely uh, learn something new and say okay i was wrong i would I'm, I'm 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 very happy to be proven wrong in anything i say <laughs> obviously that's how we learn right we keep learning we keep learning who who knows everything nobody right we keep learning guys all right what do you think of this article guys have you used celery have you used rabbitmq have you used apache kafka did you build your own asynchronous task processing at all let me know in the comment section below i'm gonna see you on the next one you guys stay awesome goodbye